Hi and welcome. Today let's do a summary of the common compression techniques with some more examples. Why we want to do it and how. We went through this topic already twice, so today let's use just a short example and look into modern drums. I have a little drum loop here, which sounds already quite nice. By the way, these are all stock samples you find in the packs. I did already a bit of leveling and EQ, but let's try if compression brings us any further. The kick I leave completely alone. To be honest, there's a much better way for sound shaping kicks than trying to make a sample fit into a new context. But this we will explore in the separate video coming soon. As you can see in the display, this sample has already a very strong attack. And fiddling with the compressor, I can perhaps define it a tiny bit more. But I doubt if that would really make any difference. For now, I leave the compressor in here, but please feel free to delete it if you feel that it doesn't help at all. There is no sense in using a compressor if a sound doesn't need any. The compressor turned the open hi-hat into something ugly. It sounds a bit grainy now and it's too long. I prefer the sound as it was before. So bye bye compressor. On the closed hi-hat though, I like how the compressor pronounces the attack on the louder hits. But that's it here already. Just to recap shortly, using a compressor for sound shaping is about controlling the relationship between the initial transient and the sustaining part, the body of the sound. Especially with drums, I mostly want to enhance the attack to let them cut through the mix. But there are situations where you want to do the opposite, taming the transient to bring up more of the body, if the strong attack makes it sounding too thin. Anyway, most samples available are already processed. Some more, some less. If you don't feel the need to compress a certain sound, or you don't like the result afterwards, just leave it. Don't compress anything just to use a compressor. I rendered out an extreme example here. As you can already tell by looking at the waveform, here and then it gets much quieter. There is a problem with such a sound in a dance mix. If you mix it in that the louder parts are perfectly hearable, the sound disappears at the quieter sections. If you mix it in that it's perfectly hearable over the whole range, the louder parts would get too loud. The same problem happens with all kinds of recordings of for example voices or acoustic instruments. 
A singer or a speaker doesn't sing or speak always at the same level. Neither does a guitarist. This would sound flat and lifeless. So we need a process to keep the nature of the sound, but which can even out the strong volume changes. This was the original purpose of a compressor, especially for broadcasting, to keep the voice of the speaker on the same level. The idea is a volume automation to bring down louder parts to more or less the same volume of the quieter parts. The actual process is very easy, bringing down the threshold at least until you see a compressor action except on the quietest parts. But by doing so, there is now a potential danger. We want the compressor to do its work, but we don't want to hear it actually working. If you hear when the compressor kicks in, this is called pumping. A very extreme example is sidechain ducking something through your kick. You can try to compensate for that with the timings of a compressor to make this effect less obvious. But sometimes this doesn't help that much. A second method, which often gives better results, is to layer several compressor instances on top of each other and let every instance do just a little bit of compression. The first one just compresses the topmost peaks. The next one just have to work on the remaining part and can work on the source which is already a bit more even. The next one goes even deeper. You get the point. We used the compressor to bring down the louder parts closer to the quieter parts. We reduced the dynamic range. This of course reduces the overall volume, but as we reduced the difference between the loudest and the quietest parts, we have gained now much more headroom to bring up everything much more than we could before. The louder parts are equally loud than before. But we brought up the quieter parts now. The difference between the loudest and the quietest parts is much smaller now and we perceive the new overall sound as being louder. In this example, this is all good and well and it does what we have been often told a compressor would do. To decrease the dynamic range and to make the sound louder. But what about our drums? 
We compressed single drum hits, but we couldn't make them really louder, as they would clip because of the strong transient. The problem is that by using a compressor to reduce the loudest parts, it would destroy the transients of our drum hits and they would lose definition and clarity. Some clever people have now simply turned this concept onto its head. Instead of reducing the louder parts, they searched for ways to increase the volume of just the quieter parts. We take the whole drum bus and smash it completely by a compressor. Extreme ratio, extreme threshold and extreme timings. Everything gets squeezed together and with more volume it sounds horrible. But this doesn't matter. I have turned the mix knob to 100% dry and play my drum loop. Now have a look on the loudness meters. The left one shows the signal before, the dry signal. The right one, the signal after the process. Keep an eye especially on the peak volume and the short term max, which are still identical. Watch what happens if I bring in the wet signal from our smashing compressor. The peak level has even decreased a bit, but we brought up the loudness by nearly two luffs. So what happened here? We smashed the drums together that basically just the body of the sound remained. The body is where the volume, where the loudness of the sound lives. I made the signal much louder as I had after the smashing enough headroom to do so. I replace bit by bit the old body, which is low in volume of the dry drums, with the very loud body of the compressed position. The clarity and definition of the drums remains, as we didn't treat the transients at all. But it gets pushed now from below. This works very well for all kind of material where changing the transients would change the overall sound. Second, this is a great way to avoid any pumping we had to deal with in our previous example. Even if you perhaps don't know that you've used this method already, many of you actually did. At least everybody who used Sound Goodizer, the LMH mix knob of Maximus or something like Xverse OTT. The big knob of Sound Goodizer is nothing else than the LMH mix knob in Maximus. The mix knob of OTT or the mix knob we have just used for the drums. We use compression in all cases and turning the mix fully clockwise is mostly a too extreme setting. But blending the extreme with the dry does magic. What are the differences here? A limiter is nothing else than a compressor with a ratio of infinity. Normally, the ratio defines how much volume of the signal is left after the compression. With a ratio of 1 to 1, there happens no compression at all. With the ratio of 2 to 1, if a signal goes above the threshold by 6 dB, 
there are 3 dB coming out. With a ratio of 4 to 1, I've got left from the same 6 dB just 1.5. With a ratio of 6 to 1, I end up with 1 dB. All of these ratios have one problem in common. No matter how I set it, I end up with an outcoming signal which is higher than the set threshold. This is not acceptable for a limiter. Threshold here means, no matter how much volume I put in, it must not exceed the set threshold value under any circumstances. This is a ratio of infinity. The limiter's biggest strength is at the same time its biggest weakness. It is a simple volume automation. It is a big strength because it doesn't change the waveform. It changes just the volume of the waveform. There is basically no distortion happening. I can push this sine wave into the limiter like crazy. There are no harmonics created and the oscilloscope shows still a pure sine wave. But being volume automation, from a certain point on, the sound doesn't get any louder, no matter how hard I push it. On top of that, it does not work very well on transients either. Watch this example here with the drum loop. Concentrate on the part when kick and snare play together. The attack of kick and snare get lowered extremely in volume. They got ducked away. Quieter means less noticeable. And that is the least thing I like to do with the attack of my kick and snare. Now let's have a look at the clipper. I use this free VST here as it got a nice visual display. Think of a clipper as a pair of scissors. Everything that exceeds a certain length is simply cut off. The same happens with the transients here of our drum loop. I can raise the volume quite a bit without losing the definition of the attacks. And it gets louder and louder. But you hear it. All that glitters is not gold. Clipping means distorting a sound as I change the waveform, what creates additional harmonics. On transients it's unhearable. First, they are much too short as I could hear any unwanted frequencies. Second, they are much too high in the frequency range as I could hear any harmonics being created which would be even higher. But as soon as it comes to the lower frequencies, the ones which are lasting longer and which harmonics are widely in the hearable spectrum, the problem gets more and more noticeable. So clipping can be perfectly used for cutting off single peaks, but has to stop before audible distortion occurs. The limiter is perfectly fine to bring up lower parts of the signal to raise the overall loudness without causing distortion. Here is a different example why the limiter isn't a good loudness maximizer on its own, especially for drums. On the left hand side I recorded the output of the limiter and on the right hand side the clipper. Our hearing doesn't recognize peak volumes at all. What we hear as being loud or quiet is the average volume of a sound and in such waveform displays this is represented by the body of the waveform. On the left hand side the limiter left the shape of the transient intact but pushed everything down together. This results in a very clean sound without any distortion, but the part which we perceive as being loud got pushed down as well. 
The clipper though just cut off the peaks, the tops of the waveform. Going too far, this causes audible distortion. But to the right amount, it provides us with a full-blown body and a much higher average volume. The sound has more loudness. We already covered this topic and I don't think there have to be said much more about it. Important is just to note another time that sidechain compression is not just the typical ducking effect, for example the kick ducks the bass. Sidechain compression is everything when the detection circle of the compressor receives a different signal than the compression circle and can be used for multiple tasks, as for example shown in my Vocals to Song series. I think this is enough for today. There's just one thing left, which we will cover in the next video to complete this topic. The next video is about the different processing systems. Downward compression, upward compression and their counterparts with expansion. I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding and we will have a deeper look into that. Stay tuned and thank you for watching.